That's Nick. And that's Joseph. And today we're here to talk about Kokomo City, the debut of director D. Smith, uh, which premiered at the 2023 Sundance Film Festival in the next program, where it won two awards, including the Audience Award. Uh, it is being released courtesy of Magnolia Pictures on July 28th, 2023. Did you say directorial debut? Yeah, so D. Oh. Smith, uh, I, I know, was involved with Love and Hip Hop Hollywood back in oh. 2014. Okay. Uh, but when she transitioned, uh, she was kind of uh, pariah in the music. She was a music producer uh, and so has had to kind of rebuild her career. Oh, D. Smith is a trans woman? Mm -hmm. Oh, nice. Mm -hmm. Okay, the premise. A raw depiction of the lives of four black trans sex workers as they confront the dichotomy between the black community and themselves. Okay, my pull quote would be a compelling and important look at the lives of four black trans women. Uh, mine's similar, a, a beautifully shot quartet on the experiences of black trans women. Uh, I think it's also uh, worth noting that D. Smith was also the editor and cinematographer. I think this film looks, but besides like the very uh, interesting, important things that the film's talking about, it looks really good. I, I, I agree. I really like the look of the film. I think the four women who were cast as the subjects are so they're, they're such a nice contrast they just have they each have a distinct personality obviously but i think they work so well in telling this very specific story so um for that alone i would recommend this mm -hmm. so the four women are leah mitchell coco didal daniela carter and dominique silver mm -hmm. and yeah we're basically hearing about their experiences as trans women black trans women and also sex workers mm -hmm. and each of them have a very different experience so starting with leah michelle or leah mitchell <laughs> leah michelle different <laughs> that that awful lady from glee no, <laughs> no leah mitchell um she is like the comedian of the group oh yeah she's mischievous for sure. i really really mm -hmm. liked her um she we see her uh she has a boyfriend so we get some uh some of their dynamic, but she opens the documentary telling a story about one day there was some trade at her place and she was about to perform oral sex on him when she saw he had a gun. So she freaked out, grabbed the gun, pulled it on him, but couldn't figure out how to shoot it. So he ended up leaving, but then he calls her back and explains that he's kind of like a notable rapper. Mm -hmm. So once she realized that, and then he explained, I carry the gun because a lot of y'all be trying to rob fools. This bitch said, well, do you want to come back? Mm -hmm. And so he did. That sent me. But mm -hmm. her personality, I, I really enjoyed it. Mm -hmm. But it was quite the start to this documentary. Um, Coco de Dahl, who we know was murdered. Uh, on April 18th, 2023. So I saw this uh, at Sun out of Sundance. So by the time I saw it then and now, like she's been murdered. It's very, that which is fresh. Yeah. Uh, uh, not unlike Paris's Burning, where before that film was even uh, completely edited, you know. Venus Extravaganza yeah. was murdered. Um, but Coco de Dahl, she's sort of the most, like, professional of the four. Like, she is a sex worker. She's about her business. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's kind of all she talks about is her business. Um, but still captivating. Then Daniela Carter who I think is the highlight of the documentary. Oh, yeah. I, I mean, some, anybody, somebody watching this needs to reach out to her. She needs to be guest lecturing, writing. I mean, just... She has some really insightful commentary on race, polit race politics, the black community, the trans uh, experience. But, yeah, I found her captivating. Mm -hmm. And the way she shot, because specifically her we see her in like what looks like a booth at a restaurant and she shot like at an angle like looking up i thought that was very powerful and then one of her most sort of like i think uh impactful moments is her in a bathtub mm -hmm. then we see her like walking out like in a park just very well shot but her then the words coming out of her mouth were very powerful she kept making me think of my problem with the first like two or three episodes of Pose, for instance, were that let the, these women should just be uh, improvising their dialogue. Yeah, yeah. And lastly, Dominique Silver, who is, um, I mean, she's the beauty, I guess. I mean, they're all beautiful, but yeah. she's clearly like, she, 
I took her as being the one who's sort of living that life because she does talk about being taken care of, needing to be taken care of, how she doesn't like that some trans women out men mm -hmm. who are attracted to them because basically they're causing the well to run dry. And so she's saying clearly someone like her needs that well. And we can see it. Well, and she also has a, a, a couple interesting moments, but one in particular, I think she's in the back of a car talking about how it's just easier to... She doesn't use the word stealth, but that that's what she's saying. It's, it's that people don't know that I'm a trans woman. Well, she has a certain privilege, and I think yeah. she's important to the documentary because of the four. I would think that she most benefits from that privilege yeah. of uh, passing. Which is what makes the closing shot so powerful because she allows herself to be photographed in, a, I think, a stunning yeah, so Dominique is the final shot of the film and we see her, she's in like a dressing robe, but it's open. So we see her nude body and we see her penis. And uh, yeah, it's, it's, well, I also thought it's really good marketing for her too. Cause yeah. I mean, you know, she, she's, for anyone who finds her appealing, now she's extra appealing. But um, there, Aside from that, we get two gentlemen in a car who I assumed were straight men mm -hmm. who are talking about men who are attracted to trans women. They're also talking about like homosexuality a lot, which was interesting. Well, and the problem with being DL. Yeah, mm -hmm. which I appreciated their perspective. I think one downside of the documentary is I, I would have wanted more perspectives because aside from those two men, then we get a guy who's calling himself low like the demon low. I, I understood why he was included, but I could have used less of him. His real name is Michael Carlos Jones, and he's involved in the entertainment industry. He says he's written songs for Diddy, Beyonce, and Janet Jackson. So, of course, I had to look him up. He does have music credits. I couldn't find anything for Janet Jackson, though. Mario Winans? I believe so. But, yes, I understand why he's included, but the other thing is this documentary is short. It's like 73 it's minutes. hour and 13, yeah. So it's short, but it feels repetitive because we hear specifically Lowe just repeat himself about like how he's interested in a trans woman, but he wouldn't date her because she has a penis. That, that she, he's talked to online. But, but that if she had the full surgery, she might, he, he, he would definitely want to talk to her. It's just kind of repetitive. and He's not the most articulate about it. I really wish you would have had more perspectives from more cis men or men and people who are attracted to these women. Mm -hmm. um, because I think the juxtaposition of that outlook combined with these women primarily talking about sex work, there's a disconnect because these men are talking about, you know, the specifically low. He's not talking about sex work per se. He's talking about a relationship. Mm -hmm. So it's like, that feels like he's on an island by himself. Kind of, yeah. I felt bad for Coco the doll because yeah. she clearly has a lot of trauma she has not processed. And she also feels repetitive, unfortunately, because all she can talk about is how she doesn't... The only thing she cares about is trade and getting her money. She's all about her business. Like, everything out of her mouth is that. Well, and pretty cynical, too. Very cynical. But, but understandably, understandably so. It, yeah. It's just that she hasn't had the privilege of being able to really process some things. Especially as compared to somebody like Dominique. Yeah. But, you know, a pretty sobering moment in the documentary is Coco talking about how, like, a lot of girls like her don't make it out. Like, they, they're, they're killed. And then she says that she's almost been killed two or three times. So then to find out that she was actually murdered in that way is really yeah, it's, upsetting. Uh, yeah, and, and also so much has changed and also so much hasn't. It's frustrating. I feel like a lot of time could be spent talking about Daniela, which is why I think I would recommend watching this film because mm -hmm. she has a lot of... They all have poignant things to say, but I think specifically... She said something I'd never thought about, which is she talks about her own mother and how she kind of needed to process with her mother that she's losing another black man, mm -hmm. like her son, who, because of the other black men in her life who had abandoned her, she really relied on her son taking care of her. And now that her son is her daughter, she's not there for her in that way. And she talks about, like, actually, I'm more vulnerable now that I'm a black trans woman. I thought that was very powerful. Yeah. Um, but she has a lot of things to say. Some of them are a little inflammatory. Not that I don't agree, but I think that, you know, she's definitely like, she's speaking very passionately about her experience. 
And I found it, uh, I mean, this is very powerful. Yeah. Another phrase, I think when she's in the bathtub talking about how like, this is survival work. Like we are, we're yeah. putting people in a position where they, they, they have to put themselves in danger to survive. Yeah. I mean, I mean, you know, inherently there's nothing surprising to me in this documentary. And, and I, you know, my fear for it would be that it's, it's going to reside in the circles of people that already are interested in or are, are part of this community rather than the people that need to see it and experience it and, and, and I don't know, just bear witness to what these women are saying. Two more things. I was introduced to an artist, I guess, from like the 30s named Kokomo Arnold. Where the title comes from, yeah. And he uh, has a song called Sissy Man Blues from like 1930-something, I think. We, they have a... That's about bisexuality. That's pretty interesting. The lyrics are uh, quite bawdy, yeah. Then, the there is there is one other gentleman in the film who whose name is Lennox Love. He says he's trans-attracted, but he is like a party promoter and started uh, like uh, a night called Hush, mm -hmm. which I wasn't sure. It sounds like one of those gay parties like that are like these private sex parties, basically, yeah. where um, trans women are invited to be like strippers and sex workers, and then the people who want that attend these private parties. But I thought that was interesting because the way he's talking is like, you created this night to fetishize these women. Like, what you're describing is... <laughs> so, I mean, it's a very complex thing that I don't know. This film does a good job of presenting it all. It's not yes. really dealing with much of it, but, I mean, it's presenting it, and I think in that regard... It is important um, viewing. What would you give this documentary? Uh, three and a half. I would give it three out of five. Anything else? No. Hit the thanks button. Listen to our podcast. Bye. <laughs>